As we continue to look for an answer to that normative question of how should we live our lives, we've looked at utilitarianism. Utilitarians say you should live your life in such a way as to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. This means you can't selfishly pursue your own happiness. You can't pursue your own hopes and dreams and goals. You should be acting in such a way as to try to promote happiness for as many people as you can. Because after all, every single person's happiness counts just as much as yours. So you shouldn't be promoting your own happiness over anyone else's. You should be working to promote happiness for everyone. The ontological ethics, on the other hand, gives us a set of rules to live by. So we saw Kant had this categorical imperative. It's supposed to help us figure out what's right and what's wrong, but it holds in an absolute sense. Kant's categorical imperative says you should live in this particular way no matter what the stakes are, no matter what the consequences are. So morality commands us to live in a particular way according to a particular list of rules, regardless of what we want, regardless of what makes us happy. You just have to live in this certain particular way. And one way of phrasing the categorical imperative was to say you should always treat persons as an end in and of themselves, never merely as a means. And the way I paraphrased that was don't treat people like objects. Treat them with the dignity, with the respect that they deserve. So you can't just use people for their money or their resources or anything like that. You have to treat them with respect. So any way of life that involves using people as a mere means to an end, that's a bad way of living. Now, interestingly, something common to utilitarianism as put forth by John Stuart Mill and deontological ethics as developed by Immanuel Kant is that both of them seem to kind of give us a formula for figuring out what's morally right and what's morally wrong. So we could use the principle of utility to try to do the calculus on which actions are going to lead to more happiness for more people. And then Kant gave us that test where we could see, does this rule for action lead to a contradiction? If it does, then I have to do the opposite. But whatever the case, the details aside, each author is giving us a way to test which actions are right and which are wrong. And you can do that as soon as you understand the test. Regardless of what your desires are, regardless of what your background knowledge is, as soon as you understand these tests that Mill and Kant are giving us, you can figure out what the right courses of action are or what the wrong courses of action are. Virtue ethics, on the other hand, which is our focus today, looks very different. In fact, virtue ethics is really not going to give us a formula for trying to discern what's right and what's wrong in a given situation. And for the virtue ethicist, morality is really focused on being a good person. So having the right sorts of character traits. We saw utilitarianism was really about consequences. Deontological ethics, that's about rules. Virtue ethics is about character. It's about what type of person you are. So if you want to live a morally good life, then be the right kind of person. Develop the right sorts of character traits, and that's what morality is fundamentally about. And this is going to matter in part because for the virtue ethicist, there's no magical formula that anyone can use to figure out what's right and what's wrong. Instead, in order to see what's right or what's wrong, you have to be the right kind of person. And so having moral exemplars, people who are good people, tell us or teach us what's right, that's going to be a lot more important than any sort of formulaic test. But this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So to start, I'm just going to talk about some key terms in virtue ethics. So first, virtue is just in a very general sense an excellence. At the general level, we can say a virtue of some particular object or entity is a trait that makes it a good instance of that entity. For example, think about a surgical scalpel. What traits does a surgical scalpel have to have in order to make it a good instance of that type of thing? So what makes a scalpel a good scalpel? And we can think, okay, it should be sharp, it should be easy to hold, it should be sanitary, it should be sturdy, we don't want it breaking apart when it's being used, it should be not too heavy or not too large, and so on. So for example, a dull scalpel, which has a really hard time cutting, that's going to be a really bad scalpel to be using. Or similarly, if a scalpel is the size of a broadsword, that's a bad scalpel. We don't want a physician using that in the course of surgery. So as we're thinking about traits that make a scalpel a good scalpel, those traits, like sharpness, being easy to hold, and so on, 
those are virtues of a scalpel. They're the traits that make a scalpel a good scalpel. And so when it comes to virtue, you can just think very generally, a virtue of some entity or object, we'll just say X, a virtue of X is a trait that makes X a good X. So think about any object or entity and separate the good ones from the bad ones. The good ones have particular traits that make them good. And those are the virtues of that sort of thing. So when it comes to people, whatever traits make a person a good person, those are virtues. Those traits are virtues. So this raises the question, what are the traits that good people have that bad people don't? And this might seem like a hard question to answer. The scalpel case was really easy. And that's partly because we know what a scalpel is for. So we know that a scalpel is for making very precise surgical cuts. And so we think about what traits does a scalpel have to have in order to do its job well. Or to put it a little bit differently, a scalpel has a particular function, and that is to perform these precise surgical cuts. So what traits allow a scalpel to perform its function well? And whatever those traits are, those are virtues for a scalpel. So thinking about human beings, we can ask the question, what is the function of a human being? Because if we understand the function of a human being, then whatever traits allow the human being to function well, those traits are virtues for people. So to better understand what a virtue for a person is, we have to think about what, what is the function of a person? What's the purpose of a person? And one possibility is we don't have a function. Right? It, it's possible that people just don't have a function at all. Then it might even be impossible to figure out what a virtue is, because if virtues are the sorts of traits that allow us to perform our function well, and we don't have a function, then it seems like there's no such thing as a virtue. But this view that human beings don't have a function, we have some reason to think that that view is false. And so drawing from Aristotle, who's probably the most important author in Western philosophy on virtue, Aristotle thought that if our parts, so think about all the parts of a human being, if each of our parts has a function, then the whole organism has a function as well. And so, for example, the function of a heart is to circulate blood, right? The function of an eye is to enable the body to see. So all of your parts have a particular function, and that means the whole organism must have a function as well. By comparison, Think about parts of a car. So every part of a car has weight. It weighs something. That means the whole car together has weight. So it's cumulative, it's additive. So the inference from every part of a human being has a function, therefore the human being has a function, is not necessarily a bad inference. It could very well be like weight, where if every part of a car weighs something, then the whole car together weighs something as well. So we can debate what the function of a human being is, but for the time being, for Aristotle, he thought that human beings at the core are rational social animals. And so functioning well means functioning well as a rational social animal. So whatever traits are needed to function well rationally, those are virtues, and whatever traits are needed to function well as a social being, those are gonna be virtues as well. If we start off by talking about the social side of things, what character traits allow a human being to function well within society? What makes a human being a good member of society? And Aristotle thought that traits like justice or generosity or courage, all of those traits help you function as a social creature well. So unjust people, for example, they don't get along in society very well when they're stealing from people things that aren't theirs, that creates conflict, right? That interferes with social interaction. So whatever character traits help you function as a social being, those are virtues for a human being. Generosity is similar. People who are generous get along well in society. So generosity seems to help us function as social creatures. Whereas people who are stingy, who just hold on to their money and don't give it to anybody, they have a harder time functioning in society. So that means generosity 
is going to be a type of virtue for human beings as well. Honesty might be another one where people who are dishonest don't flourish as well in society, whereas people who are honest tend to do better. Now, there are going to be exceptions to these sorts of things, and that's fine, because these are just generalizations, but the idea is just to function well as a social creature, being generous, being just, being honest, seem like good traits that allow you to function well in society. On the other hand, we can talk about rationality, because remember, human beings for Aristotle are social, rational animals, so we can ask what character traits allow you to function as a rational being to a high extent. So things like wisdom or practical wisdom, where wisdom deals with knowledge of the universe, particularly unchanging things like mathematics, or practical wisdom, that deals with figuring out the right thing to do, figuring out how to solve problems in concrete situations. Or maybe even patience and temperance. Patience in being able to think through problems, to reason through problems. Temperance in that you're not overwhelmed by bodily desire. So the temperate person doesn't overeat, and they don't overindulge in alcohol or any other sorts of bodily pleasures. That's important because if you're going to function as a rational being, that means all of your bodily appetites should be controlled by reason. So being rational means not just being able to think through problems, solve problems, but also controlling your own appetites so that you're operating according to what's healthy for a human being. And when it comes to practical wisdom, I mentioned this is the ability to look into a, a concrete situation and kind of see how to solve problems, see what the right thing to do is in a particular circumstance. This is applying reason to your everyday life. So the practically wise person has the ability to look into a situation and solve problems using their rationality to overcome obstacles and to even make the world a better place in various ways. So you're using reason and applying it, putting it to work to try to better the world. That's part of what it means to function well as a rational being. So just to recap so far, we said human beings, for Aristotle at least, are social, rational animals. Virtues are those character traits that allow them to function well as social and rational beings. So whatever character traits allow a human being to function well in terms of their social and rational capabilities, those traits are virtues. And it looked like functioning well in a social sense, that means being just, being generous. Functioning well in a rational sense, that means having practical wisdom being temperate. All of these different character traits count as virtues. Now you should still wonder though, how does this connect back with morality? So okay, we've, we've understood what it means to function well as a human being. We've understood a little bit about what character traits might help a human being function well, but what does this have to do with right and wrong, good and evil? Well, for Aristotle, the morally right actions that one should perform in any given situation are the things that perfectly virtuous people would do. So you drop a perfectly virtuous person into a particular situation, and you ask, what would they do in this particular scenario? And whatever that answer is, that's the morally right thing to do. So the virtuous person serves as the moral standard. The virtuous person, whatever they would do, however they would act, whatever they would say, that's the right thing to do in any given circumstance. That's what morality says we should do. We should act like the virtuous person. Not just act like them, but we should try to become the virtuous person as well. So if you want to know what the right thing to do is in a given situation, ask somebody who's virtuous. The virtuous person is the one who can see into the situation to see what's right and what's wrong. In other words, if you were perfectly virtuous, then in any given situation, you'd have the capabilities to see what's morally right and what's morally wrong. So as a virtuous person, whatever the virtues are leading you to do, that's what everyone ought to do in that same scenario. The virtuous person, again, serves as the moral standard for what's right and what's wrong. If you want to know the right thing to do, ask the virtuous person, or imagine what the virtuous person would do in a particular scenario. Now, alternatively, if you're in a situation and you're having a hard time figuring out what's right and what's wrong, that might actually be evidence that you haven't fully developed virtues yet. 
So people who haven't fully developed the virtues might struggle to understand what's right or what's wrong in a given situation because they haven't developed their character far enough to the point where they can see the right answer. So again, in trying to discern what's morally right and what's wrong, consult the virtuous person. Consult people who are moral exemplars, and they're the ones who are going to give you judgments about what's right and what's wrong that you can trust. But you can't come up with any sort of mathematical standard or Kantian test to give you the right answer. You've got to go consult the experts to figure out what's right and what's wrong. And as one other aspect of virtue ethics, it's not enough that you act in a virtuous way. So virtue is not just about acting in the right way. Virtue is about acting in the right way, for the right reason, at the right time, towards the right person, and having the right emotions as well. So if you're a just person, if you have the virtue of justice, and you see something terribly unjust happen, you should respond with anger. In fact, if you see something unjust, something that's genuinely unjust happen in front of you, and you're indifferent towards it, or you even laugh at it, you think it's funny, then clearly you're not a virtuous person. You lack the virtue of justice. The just person who sees an injustice will become angry at it, and somebody who lacks the virtue of justice might have a different response, a different emotional response. So if you have the wrong emotional response to a situation, that might be evidence that you lack virtue. The virtuous person doesn't just do the right thing, but they do the right thing for the right reason at the right time with the right motivation. So they're driven by the right sorts of values and concerns. They don't just do what's right because it's right. They do what's right because they want to do what's right. So the just person will do what's just, not because it's the right thing to do, but because they love justice. In fact, the just person will feel pleasure when justice is done. So for example, if a crime is committed and somebody's punished for it and that's painful for you to see, that might be evidence that you're not just because a just person is going to be pleased to see justice be done. Being virtuous, it's not just about doing the right thing. It's about doing the right thing for the right reason. And it's about feeling the right way when you do something good. Maybe a different example, if you struggle with generosity, so you've got a lot of resources, let's say, and it's hard for you to give those up to donate to people who really need them, that's a sign that you lack the virtue of generosity. Because the generous person wants to give their things away. They want to help people in need. And it brings them pleasure to do that. Not only is it easy for the generous person to give away their resources, but that's what they want to do. That's what makes them happy. So if you do the right thing and you're not happy about it, you're struggling to do the right thing, it's painful for you to do, that's clear evidence that you're not a virtuous person. At least, you need more work to become a virtuous person. We could say the same sort of thing with temperance as well. So temperance, again, it's about managing your bodily desires, managing your appetites, taking them and controlling them with your reason. So you don't overindulge in eating, you don't overindulge in drinking. If it's hard for you to do that, if you're really tempted and you really want to overindulge, that's a clear sign that you're not temperate. Because the temperate person not only does the right thing, their bodily appetites are controlled by their reason, so they don't overeat, they don't overindulge, but they want to not overindulge. They desire to not overindulge. And in fact, it makes them happy they don't have any sort of struggle. There's no internal conflict for the virtuous person. They're not struggling to do the right thing. They're not struggling to resist overindulgence. They just resist it without effort. It's easy for them. So if you feel this internal conflict where you know what's right, but you're struggling to do the right thing, or sometimes you fail, that's clear evidence that you haven't developed virtue yet. You may be on the way to it. So as we practice virtue, we develop the virtues. But if you're struggling to do what's right, that's clear evidence that you haven't gotten there yet. You haven't attained virtue yet. Or to put it a little differently, if you're struggling to do what's right, you're struggling to do what's virtuous, you struggle to be just, you struggle to be generous, you struggle to be courageous. The answer to overcoming that struggle is to keep practicing. 
So Aristotle thought that the most important thing you can do is habituate yourself, continue to practice virtue. By continuing to practice virtue, you're developing the character trait. It becomes more natural for you to do the right thing. So if I'm struggling to do the right thing all the time, by practicing, by continuing to force myself to do the right thing, I might eventually get to the point where it becomes natural for me to do that. It, it becomes a habit for me to do the right thing. If I lack virtue, that doesn't mean I can't attain it. I just have to practice and continue to work at it until I reach that level. So if generosity is painful for me, I have to just keep giving and keep giving and keep giving to the point where eventually it just becomes natural for me and I no longer am pained by giving away my resources. Or with temperance, if I struggle with overindulgence in food or whatever, I have to keep training myself to not overindulge and eventually it'll just become natural for me to not engage in those sorts of behaviors. And because of this, because habituation and training is so important to the development of virtue, this is why Aristotle thought that having the right education as kids is super important. You have to be brought up to feel pain and pleasure at the right things in the right way from childhood. At least this is what Aristotle thought. He thought if you're not raised in the right sort of way, you're not raised to develop virtue, you're probably going to end up less than virtuous as an adult, and there's really nothing we can do. So Aristotle thought once you hit a certain point, you're probably not going to change your character. If you grow up in the wrong sort of way, you have bad teachers or bad influences who are not helping you develop virtue, you're probably going to get to a point in adulthood where that's not going to change. You're never going to be a virtuous person because you had the wrong education and you're kind of out of luck. Now, whether that's true or not, whether people can change, we can debate that. This is just what Aristotle thought. But his point is just habituation and training and practice at doing the right thing and feeling pleasure at doing the right thing. That's got to start early on. That's got to start when you're a kid. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard to develop virtue later in life. But either way, if you lack virtue, the idea is you can try to train yourself to become virtuous and to help get you there, you're going to need the right sort of influences, the right sort of educators, people who are moral exemplars. So go to people who are already virtuous and ask them for insight, ask them to help you become more like them. This is the importance of having good teachers. So if you're trying to develop patience, Go find somebody who's patient and ask them, how did they develop this? What sort of practices did they engage in to develop patience? Try to figure out, learn from them, learn from moral exemplars how to be more virtuous and then practice those behaviors until you develop virtue yourself. So that's how you get virtue. But let's go all the way back to a practical scenario. So take the surgeon example, the surgeon who's deciding whether or not to kill an innocent person take their organs and save five others. We talked about this in the last two videos. What's the morally right thing to do in this scenario? Should the surgeon kill the healthy patient, take the organs or not? And Aristotle is going to say, whatever the virtuous person would do here, that's what's morally right. So again, the virtuous person is the standard of morality. Whatever they would do in this scenario, that's the right thing to do. And that might be hard to figure out. It might be hard to imagine, well, what would the virtuous person do here? But if we think about any concrete scenario and we say the morally right thing to do in this scenario is just do whatever the virtuous person would do, that's not a clear answer, right? Because we might not know. We might not know what the perfectly virtuous person would do. So Aristotle is not giving us a kind of mathematical formula where we can figure out what the right answer is. Mill would say maximize pleasure for the greatest number. Kant would say, let's run this universalizability test. So both of them give us these sort of mechanics where we can figure out what the right thing to do is. Aristotle is going to say, go ask the virtuous person. Like if you're having a hard time figuring out what the right thing to do is, ask somebody who's virtuous what the right thing to do is and go based off of their advice. Because whatever the virtuous person would do, that sets the standard for what's morally good. and so. Yeah, virtue ethics doesn't give you nice, clean, mathematical formulas that allow you to figure out what's right and what's wrong, but that's because morality is really messy. So we saw with deontological ethics, Kant's categorical imperative, that didn't seem to admit of enough flexibility. 
But virtue ethics admits of tons of flexibility because the virtuous person is going to tune in to different aspects of different situations. So situations might be subtly different in ways that the virtuous person will say, okay, doing action A is right in this scenario, but it's wrong in a very similar scenario, and here's why. So virtue ethics is going to be a lot more flexible to the particularities of situations, whereas something like deontological ethics, as presented by Kant, that was sort of like, here are some exceptionalist rules, no matter what the stakes are. So virtue ethics has built into it a lot more flexibility, but that frustrates a lot of people because it doesn't always give clear answers. A lot of people will complain and say, when Aristotle tells me the right thing is to just do whatever the virtuous person would do, that's not informative. Like, I want an answer. I want a clear answer as to what I should do. And Aristotle's going to say, it's not that easy, right? You have to develop these virtues in order to see what's the right thing to do. And once you do that, once you have the virtues, then figuring out moral issues, navigating moral terrain, that becomes a lot easier. But until you develop the virtues, you've got to rely on the testimony of virtuous people, or you've got to think about what would the perfectly virtuous person do in order to figure out what the morally right thing is. As one last thought, why care? Why care about being virtuous? Why, why bother? Why not think to yourself, I'll be a lot more happy personally if I overindulge whenever I want to or just live however I want and don't really care about developing virtues of justice or generosity. I, don't, I just don't care. What do we say to a person like that who just says, I don't really care about being virtuous? And for Aristotle, the answer might be as simple as this person didn't get a very good education. They didn't learn how to value the right sorts of things. They're just going to function badly. They're a rational social animal. They can't change that. No human being can change the fact that they are a rational social animal. All you can do is function well as a rational social animal or function poorly as one. But you can't change your nature. You have an inherent nature of being rational and social. Nothing you do, nothing you believe will change that. And so some people, those who develop virtues, are going to function well. They're going to be good human beings. And some people just aren't. So what do we do with the person who functions badly, who's a bad human being, but doesn't care? And the answer is, well, they had a bad education. They developed in the wrong ways. They're just broken. And Aristotle thought there's nothing we can do. They might be at a point where they just can't be trained out of that anymore. If you're raised in such a way that you don't care about being a good person, there might be nothing left for us to say. There might be nothing left for us to do. And by analogy, without my placing judgment on anyone, this is just an example, think about people who continue to smoke. It's known to be physically destructive to the body. It's known to cause cancer. It has all these negative effects, but people know that and keep on doing it. And so what do you tell them? You say, look, this is really bad for you. This is really harmful for you. You can show them pictures of, of lungs that have developed lung cancer. And they say, well, look, I don't care. Well, okay, like you're gonna lead an unhealthy life. That's, that's up to you. And there comes a point where there's just nothing more I can say. You're just going to hurt yourself by continuing this habit. The same sort of thing goes for the non-virtuous person. If they just say, I don't care about being a good person, there comes a point where there's just nothing more we can say. They're going to be a broken human being, a bad human being. That's what they've chosen. That's how they were raised, according to Aristotle. And that's, there's just nothing more we can do. Now, there are other people who are on the fence, who struggle to do what's right, who sometimes fail to do what's right, they go back and forth, they've got a lot of inner turmoil. Those people might, with the right influences, with the right training, become virtuous. They might overcome those sort of negative desires to do bad things. But people who have embraced it, who have said, this is who I am, I just wanna live however I want, I don't care about being a good person, Aristotle at least thought there comes a point where there's nothing more you can do. They're just going to be bad human beings, and that's, that's the end of it. So the fact that we can't always convince people to be virtuous, that's not a strike against virtue ethics. It just points to a fundamental claim that Aristotle makes, at least, that in order to be a good person, you have to have the right sort of training, the right sort of education, the right sort of influences that help you develop and flourish as a social, rational animal. And if you don't have that, if you develop in the wrong sort of way, 
you might just fail to flourish. You might fail to be a good social or good rational animal. And that's just how things played out. And a lot of this might not sound good, right? It sounds like we're condemning and judging and those sorts of things. Um, Aristotle would be okay with that. He thinks that, yes, there really are such things as bad people and good people, and these character traits are what separate them. So just to be clear, I'm just presenting Aristotle's view here without passing judgment of my own, so we can continue to talk about whether Aristotle's view is reasonable or not. But all that being said, we talked about virtue ethics. It focuses on people, what it means to be a good person, as opposed to performing the right actions or bringing about the right consequences. We saw that on virtue ethics as presented by Aristotle, human beings have a particular function. They're rational social animals, and virtues are the character traits that allow us to perform that function well. So a good human being is functioning well as a social rational animal. Character traits that allow us to be good social creatures might include generosity and justice, Traits that allow us to function well rationally might be things like wisdom and practical wisdom and even temperance, where our rationality is kind of taking control over our bodily appetites. Then when it comes to discerning how we should live and how we shouldn't, you should strive to develop virtue because that's what it means to flourish as a human being. So if you want to answer the question, how should I live? Well, I should try to be a healthy human being. I should try to develop the right character traits so that I can flourish as an individual member of my species. And if you don't care about that, if you don't care about your own flourishing, just like somebody who continues to smoke knowing that it's causing them physical harm, there might be nothing left that we can do to save you. You might just be on that path of self-destruction. But if you want to flourish as a human being, you should strive to develop the right sorts of traits. And furthermore, morality is grounded in virtue. So whatever the virtuous person does, whatever the perfectly virtuous person does, that's what sets the moral standard for right and wrong. So if you want to be a morally good person, then you should develop the virtues. You should strive to develop the virtues. The perfectly virtuous person, especially the practically wise person, is the person who can look into a situation, see how to solve a problem, and see how to do it in a morally upstanding way. And not only this, but the virtuous person wants to do the virtuous thing. So a just person loves justice. Seeing justice done, that brings them pleasure. That's a good experience for them. Whereas somebody who's unjust is going to be pained when justice is done. So if you're pained when justice is done, that's a sign that there's a flaw in your character. There's something wrong with your character. Now we saw with Kant, to be a morally good person means doing the right thing because it's right. That's not quite the case with the virtue ethicist. The virtue ethicist is gonna say, you should do what's virtuous because that's what you want to do, but you do what's just because you love justice. Not simply because it's right, but because you love the state of affairs where justice is done. Or you're generous to people because you love helping people. It's not because it's the right thing to do, it's because you just love people. That's why you give away your resources to help them. So the virtue ethicist is gonna say, your motivations shouldn't strictly be do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And so the virtue ethicist and Kant are gonna disagree on this point. But all that being said, we've got three different accounts that answer the normative question. So we asked the question, how should I live my life? That's the normative ethics question. Utilitarians said, maximize the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people. Kantians said, here's the categorical imperative, live according to these rules no matter what happens. And the virtue ethicist says, think about the type of being that you are, and try to be a well-functioning member of your species. So you are a social rational being, try to be a good social and a good rational being. Try to develop the character traits that allow you to function well. And once you do that, then you're going to see very clearly, here's how I ought to live and here's how I shouldn't. But until you reach that point, you're gonna have to be dependent on people who are virtuous to tell you the difference between what's right and what's wrong. Once you develop virtue, then it'll become clear to you the difference between right and wrong. Now you might be wondering, at the end of discussing these three schools of thought, why does any of this matter to bioethics? And it's gonna be important because not only have these three schools of thought dramatically influenced how bioethics is done today, especially utilitarianism and especially Kantian ethics, but a lot of people are going to be arguing from these various perspectives without explicitly acknowledging that they're doing so. 
So somebody might argue that we should make vaccines mandatory for everyone so as to promote the general health of the public, right? That's a very utilitarian way of thinking. Whereas somebody might resist that and say, no, 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 I should have a free choice about this, whether I get a vaccine or not. That's more of a Kantian perspective where the individual is left to make up their own choices one way or the other. And we can't force people to get a vaccine because that would be using them as a mere means to protect public health. So these different moral theories are often at work behind the scenes of lots of public debate, not just in bioethics, but in public discussion generally. And if you don't recognize where these ideas are coming from, you might not be able to identify the source of disagreement, and you might not be as equipped to solve ethical problems either. So by deepening your understanding of these different schools of thought, now we've got a lot of tools that we can use to not only identify the source of disagreement, but to actually work to resolve ethical problems that seem otherwise impossible to resolve. So that being said, We've covered virtue ethics, I've covered the other two. If there are lingering questions about virtue ethics or any concerns about it, if you have problems with it, whatever, I'll be happy to discuss that with you on the discussion board for this class.